Part 1 of Women of History, Selected from the Writings of Standard Authors 1. Hippotea of Alexandria Written by Brucker To the list of Alexandrian philosophers must be added the celebrated Hippotea, whose extensive learning, elegant manners, and tragical end, have rendered her name immortal. Hippotea was the daughter of Theon, a celebrated mathematician of Alexandria. She possessed an acute and penetrating judgment, and great sublimity and fertility of genius, and her talents were cultivated with assiduity by her father and other preceptors. After she had made herself mistress of polite learning, and of the sciences of geometry and astronomy, as far as they were then understood, she entered upon the study of philosophy. She prosecuted this study with such uncommon success, that she was importuned to become a public preceptress in the school where Plotinus and his successors had taught, and her love of science enabled her so far to subdue the natural diffidence of her sex, that she yielded to the public voice, and exchanged her female decorations for the philosopher's cloak. In the schools, and other places of public resort, she discoursed upon philosophical topics, explaining, and endeavoring to reconcile, the systems of Plato, Aristotle, and other masters. A ready elocution and graceful address, united with rich erudition and sound judgment, procured her numerous followers and admirers. But that which reflects the highest honor upon her memory is, that although she excelled most of the philosophers of her age in mathematical and philosophical science, she discovered no pride of learning, and though she was in person exceedingly beautiful, she never yielded to the impulse of female vanity, or gave occasion to the slightest suspicion against her chastity. The extraordinary combination of accomplishments and virtues which adorned the character of Hippotea, rendered her house the general resort of persons of learning and distinction. But it was impossible that so much merit should not excite envy. The qualifications and attainments to which she was indebted for her celebrity, proved in the issue the occasion of her destruction. It happened that at this time the patriarchal chair was occupied by Cyril, a bishop of great authority, but of great haughtiness and violence of temper. In the vehemence of his bigoted zeal, he had treated the Jews with severity, and at last banished them out of Alexandria. Orestes, the prefect of the city, a man of a liberal spirit, highly resented this expulsion, as an unpardonable stretch of ecclesiastical power, and a cruel act of oppression and injustice against a people who had inhabited Alexandria from the time of its founder. He reported the affair to the emperor. The bishop, on his part, complained to the prince of the seditious temper of the Jews, and attempted to justify his proceedings. The emperor declined to interpose his authority, and the affair rapidly advanced to the utmost extremity. A body of about five hundred monks, who espoused the cause of Cyril, came into the city with a determination to support him by force. Meeting the prefect as he was passing through the street in his carriage, they stopped him, and loaded him with reproaches, and one of them threw a stone at his head and wounded him. The populace, who were by this time assembled on the part of the prefect, rooted the monks, and seized one of their leaders, Orestes ordered him to be put to death. Cyril buried his body in the church, and gave instructions that his name should be registered among the sacred martyrs. Hippotea, who had always been highly respected by the prefect, and who had at this time frequent conferences with him, was supposed by the partisans of the bishop to have been deeply engaged in the interest of Orestes. Their resentment at length arose to such a height, that they formed a design against her life. As she was one day returning home from the schools, the mob seized her, forced her from her chair, and carried her to the Caesarean church, where, stripping off her garments, they put her to death with extreme barbarity, and, having torn her body limb from limb, committed it to the flames. Cyril himself has, by some writers, been suspected of secretly prompting this horrid act of violence, and if the haughtiness and severity of his temper, his persecution of the Jews, his oppressive and iniquitous treatment of the Novartian sect of Christians and their bishop, the vehemence of his present indignation against Orestes and his party, and, above all, the protection which he is said to have afforded to the immediate perpetrator of the murder of Hippotea, be duly considered, it will perhaps appear that this suspicion is not wholly without foundation. Hippotea was murdered under the reign of the Emperor Theodosius II, in the year 415. 2. Cleopatra of Egypt 
BC 68, BC 29. Written by Merivale. Her personal talents were indeed of the most varied kind, she was an admirable singer and musician, she was skilled in many languages, and possessed intellectual accomplishments rarely found among the staidest of her sex, combined with the archness and humor of the lightest. She exerted herself to pamper her lovers, Antony's, sensual appetites, to stimulate his flagging interests by ingenious surprises, nor less to gratify the revival of his nobler propensities with paintings and sculptures, and works of literature. She encouraged him to take his seat as gymnasiarch, or director of the public amusements, and even to vary his debauches with philosophy and criticism. She amused him by sending divers to fasten saltfish to the bait of his angling rod, and when she had pledged herself to consume the value of ten millions of cestuses at a meal, amazed him by dissolving, in the humble cup of vinegar set before her, a pearl of inestimable price. Her lover attended upon her in the forum, at the theatre, and the tribunals, he rode with her, or followed her chariot on foot, escorted by a train of eunuchs, at night he strolled with her through the city, in the garb of a slave, and encountered abuse and blows from the rabble of the streets, by day he wore the loose Persian robe, and girded himself with a median dagger, and he designated as his palace the Praetorium or General's apartment. Painters and sculptors were charged to group the illustrious pair together, and the coins of the kingdom bore the heads and names of both conjointly. The Roman legionary, with the name of Cleopatra inscribed upon his shield, found himself transformed into a Macedonian bodyguard. Masks were presented at the court, in which the versatile Plancus sank into the character of a stage buffoon, and enacted the part of the sea god Glaucus in curt cerulean vestments, crowned with the feathery heads of the papyrus, and deformed with the tail of a fish. But when Cleopatra arrayed herself in the garb and usurped the attributes of Isis, and invited her paramour to ape the deity Osiris, the portentous travesty assumed a deeper significance. It had been the policy of the Macedonian sovereigns to form an alliance between the popular superstitions of their Greek and Egyptian subjects. Ptolemy Sota prevailed on the native priesthood to sanction the consecration of a new divinity, Serapis, who, if not really of Grecian origin, was confidently identified by the Greeks with their own Pluto, or perhaps with Zeus. The Macedonians had admitted with little scruple their great hero's claims to be the offspring of Ammon, the king of gods, who was worshipped in the oasis of the desert. The notion that a mere man might become exalted into union with deity, favoured by the rationalizing explanations of their popular mythology already current among the learned, had gradually settled into an indulgent admission of the royal rite of apotheosis. Antony had assumed the character of Bacchus at Athens. In the metropolis of Grecian skepticism this could only be regarded as a drunken whim, but when he came forward in Alexandria as the Nile god Osiris, the Bacchus or fructifying power of the Coptic mythology, he claimed as a present deity the veneration of the credulous Egyptians. Another scene follows the death of Antony. When the ceremonies of interment were finished, Cleopatra allowed herself to be led to the palace of her ancestors. Exhausted with fever by the vehemence of her passionate mourning, she refused the care of her physician, and declared that she would perish by hunger. Octavius, the conqueror of Antony, was alarmed at the avowal of this desperate resolution, he could only prevail upon her to protract her existence by the barbarous threat of murdering her children. He held out also the hope of a personal interview, and again her vanity whispered to her not yet to despair, the artless charms of youth which, as she at least deemed, had enchained the great Julius at a single interview, had long since passed away, the more mature attractions which experience had taught her to cultivate for the conquest of her second lover, might fail under the disastrous ravages of so many years of indulgence and dissipation, but time had not blighted her genius, her distresses claimed compassion, and from pity, she well knew, there is but one step to love. In the retirement of the women's apartments she decked her chamber with sumptuous magnificence, and threw herself on a silken couch in the negligent attire of sickness and woe. She clasped to her bosom the letters of her earliest admirer, and surrounded herself with his busts and portraits, to make an impression on the filial piety of one who claimed to inherit his conquests and sympathize with his dearest interests. When the expected visitor entered, she sprang passionately to meet him, and threw herself at his feet, her eyes were red with weeping, her whole countenance was disordered, her bosom heaved, 
and her voice trembled with emotion. The marks of blows inflicted on her breast were visible in the disorder of her clothing. She addressed him as her lord, and sighed as she transferred to a stranger the sovereign title she had so long borne herself, and which she had first received from her conqueror's father. The young Roman acknowledged the charms of female beauty, and had often surrendered to them, but he knew also his own power of resisting them, which he had already sternly practiced, and he now guarded himself against her seductions by fixing his eyes obdurately on the ground. Despairing of conquest, she threw herself upon his mercy, handed to him the list of her treasures, and pleaded piteously for bare life. A slave, interrogated and threatened perhaps with torture, declaring that some of her effects were still withheld, she flew at him and tore his face with her nails. Cleopatra had tasked her powers of fascination, and she knew that they had failed, she heard without surprise that even within three days she was to be conveyed away with her children, to adorn the conqueror's triumph. She formed her plan with secrecy and decision, she directed her attendants to make ready for the voyage, and repaired with her female companions to Antony's mausoleum. She gave orders for a banquet to be served, and in the meanwhile embraced the dead man's beer, and mingled her tears with the wine she poured upon it. Soon after, she commanded all her attendants to leave her except her two favorite women, Iris and Charmian, and at the same time she sent a sealed packet to be delivered to Octavius. It contained only a brief and passionate request to be buried with her lover. His first impulse was to rush to the spot and prevent the catastrophe it portended, but in the next moment the suspicion of a trick to excite his sympathy flashed across him, and he contented himself with sending persons to inquire. The messengers made all haste, but they arrived too late, the tragedy had been acted out, and the curtain was falling. Bursting into the tomb, they beheld Cleopatra lying dead on a golden couch in royal attire. Of her two women, Iris was dying at her feet, and Charmian, with failing strength, was replacing the diadem on her mistress's brow. The manner of Cleopatra's death was never certainly known. 3. Joan of Arc, 1412-1431 Written by de Quincey What is to be thought of her, what is to be thought of the poor shepherd girl from the hills and forests of Lorraine, that, like the Hebrew shepherd boy from the hills and forests of Judea, rose suddenly out of the quiet, out of the safety, out of the religious inspiration, rooted in deep pastoral solitudes, to a station in the van of armies, and to the more perilous station at the right hand of kings? Daughter of Dom Remy, when the gratitude of thy king shall awaken, thou wilt be sleeping the sleep of the dead. Call her, King of France, but she will not hear thee. Cite her by thy apparitors to come and receive a robe of honor, but she will be found en contumus, when the thunders of universal France, as even yet may happen, shall proclaim the grandeur of the poor shepherd girl that gave up all for her country, thy ear, young shepherd girl, will have been deaf for five centuries. To suffer and to do, that was thy portion in this life, that was thy destiny, and not for a moment was it hidden from thyself. Life, thou saidst, is short, and the sleep which is in the grave is long. This pure creature, pure from every suspicion of even a visionary self-interest, even as she was pure in senses more obvious, never once did this holy child, as regarded herself, relax from the belief in the darkness that was traveling to meet her. Joanna, as we in England should call her, but, according to her own statement, Jeanne, or, as M. Michelet asserts, Jean, Dark, was born at Domremy, a village on the marshes of Lorraine and Champagne, and dependent upon the town of Vancouver's. The situation, locally, of Joanna was full of profound suggestions to a heart that listened for the stealthy steps of change and fear that too surely were in motion. But, if the place were grand, the time, the burden of the time, was far more so. The air overhead, in its upper chambers, was hurtling with the obscure sound, was dark with sullen fermenting of storms that had been gathering for a hundred and thirty years. The Battle of Agincourt, in Joanna's childhood, had reopened the wounds of France. The famines, the extraordinary diseases, the insurrections of the peasantry up and down Europe, these were chords struck from the mysterious harp of the time, but these were transitory chords. By her own internal schisms, the church was rehearsing, as in still earlier forms she had already rehearsed, those vast rents in her foundations which no man should ever heal. It was not wonderful that in such a haunted solitude, 
With such a haunted heart, Joanna should see angelic visions, and hear angelic voices. These voices whispered to her forever the duty, self-imposed, of delivering France. Five years she listened to these monetary voices with internal struggles, at length she could resist no longer, doubt gave way, and she left her home forever, in order to present herself at the Dauphin's court. It is not requisite for the honor of Joan, nor is there, in this place, room to pursue her brief career of action. That, though wonderful, forms the earthly part of her story, the spiritual part is the saintly passion of her imprisonment, trial, and execution. The noble girl had achieved, as by a rapture of motion, the capital end of clearing out a free space around her sovereign, giving him the power to move his arms with effect, and, secondly, the inappreciable end of winning for that sovereign what seemed to all France the heavenly ratification of his rights, by crowning him with the ancient solemnities. But she, the child that at nineteen had wrought wonders so great for France, was she not elated, did she not lose, as men so often have lost, all sobriety of mind, when standing on the pinnacle of success so giddy, let her enemies declare, during the progress of her movement, and in the center of ferocious struggles, she had manifested the temper of her feelings, by the pity which she had everywhere expressed for the suffering enemy. She forwarded to the English leaders a touching invitation to unite with the French, as brothers, in a common crusade against infidels, thus opening the road for a soldierly retreat. She interposed to protect the captive or the wounded, she mourned over the excesses of her countrymen, she threw herself off her horse to kneel by the dying English soldier, and to comfort him with such ministrations, physical or spiritual, as his situation allowed. She sheltered the English that invoked her aid in her own quarters, she wept as she beheld, stretched on the field of battle, so many brave enemies that had died without confession, and, as regarded herself, her relation expressed itself thus, on the day when she had finished her work, she wept, for she knew that, when her triumphal task was done, her end must be approaching. Next came her trial, never from the foundations of the earth was there such a trial as this, if it were laid open in all its beauty of defense, and all its hellishness of attack. Oh, child of France, shepherdess, peasant girl, trodden underfoot by all around thee, how I honor thy flashing intellect, quick as God's lightning, and true as God's lightning to its mark, that ran before France and laggard Europe by many a century, confounding the malice of the ensnarer, and making dumb the oracles of falsehood. Woman, sister, there are some things which you do not execute as well as your brother, man, no, nor ever will, but I acknowledge you can do one thing as well as the best of us men, a greater thing than even Milton is known to have done, or Michelangelo, you can die grandly, and as goddesses would die, were goddesses mortal. The executioner had been directed to apply his torch from below, he did so, the fiery smoke rose upwards in billowing volumes, a Dominican monk was then standing almost at her side, wrapped up in his sublime office, he saw not the danger, but still persisted in his prayers, even then, when the last enemy was racing up the fiery stairs to seize her, even at that moment did this noblest of girls think only for him, the one friend that would not forsake her, and not for herself, bidding him, with her last breath, to care for his own preservation, but to leave her to God. 4. Zenobia Written by Gibbon Modern Europe has produced several illustrious women, who have sustained with glory the weight of empire, nor is our own age destitute of such distinguished characters. But if we accept the doubtful achievements of Semiramis, Zenobia is perhaps the only female whose superior genius broke through the servile indolence imposed on her sex by the climate and manners of Asia. She claimed her descent from the Macedonian kings of Egypt, equaled in beauty her ancestor Cleopatra, and far surpassed the princess in chastity and valor. Zenobia was esteemed the most lovely, as well as the most heroic of her sex, she was of a dark complexion, for in speaking of a lady, these trifles become important, her teeth were of a pearly whiteness, and her large black eyes sparkled with uncommon fire, tempered by the most attractive sweetness. Her voice was strong and harmonious, her manly understanding was strengthened and adorned by study, she was not ignorant of the Latin tongue, but possessed in equal perfection the Greek, the Syriac, and the Egyptian languages, 
she had drawn up for her own use an epitome of Oriental history, and familiarly compared the beauties of Homer and Plato under the tuition of the sublime Longinus. This accomplished woman gave her hand to Odinatus, who, from a private station, raised himself to the dominion of the East. She soon became the friend and companion of a hero. In the intervals of war, Odinatus passionately delighted in the exercise of hunting, he pursued with ardor the wild beasts of the desert, lions, panthers, and bears, and the ardor of Zenobia, in that dangerous amusement, was not inferior to his own. She had inured her constitution to fatigue, disdained the use of a covered carriage, generally appeared on horseback in a military habit, and sometimes marched several miles on foot at the head of the troops. The success of Odinatus was in a great measure ascribed to her incomparable prudence and fortitude, their splendid victories over the great king, whom they twice pursued as far as the gates of Ctesiphon, laid the foundations of their united fame and power. The armies which they commanded, and the provinces which they had saved, acknowledged not any other sovereigns than their invincible chiefs. The senate and people of Rome revered a stranger who had avenged the captive emperor, and even the insensible son of Valerian accepted Odinatus for his legitimate colleague. With the assistance of her most faithful friends, Zenobia, after the death of her husband, immediately filled the vacant throne, and governed with manly councils Palmyra, Syria, and the East, above five years. By the death of Odinatus, that authority was at an end which the Senate had granted him only as a personal distinction, but his martial widow, disdaining both the Senate and Galenus, obliged one of the Roman generals, who was sent against her, to retreat into Europe, with the loss of his army and his reputation. Instead of the little passions which so frequently perplex a female reign, the steady administration of Zenobia was guided by the most judicious maxims of policy. If it was expedient to pardon, she could calm her resentment, if it was necessary to punish, she could impose silence on the voice of pity. Her strict economy was accused of avarice, yet, on every proper occasion, she appeared magnificent and liberal, the neighboring states of Arabia, Armenia, and Persia, dreaded her enmity, and solicited her alliance, to the dominions of Odinatus, which extended from the Euphrates to the frontiers of Bithynia, his widow added the inheritance of her ancestors, the populous and fertile kingdom of Egypt. The emperor Claudius acknowledged her merit, and was content that, while he pursued the Gothic war, she should assert the dignity of the empire in the east. The conduct, however, of Zenobia was attended with some ambiguity, nor is it unlikely that she had conceived the design of erecting an independent and hostile monarchy. She blended, with the popular manners of Roman princes, the stately pomp of the courts of Asia, and exacted from her subjects the same adoration that was paid to the successes of Cyrus. She bestowed on her three sons a Latin education, and often showed them to the troops adorned with the imperial purple. For herself she reserved the diadem, with the splendid but doubtful title of Queen of the East. When Aurelian passed over into Asia, Zenobia would have ill-deserved her reputation had she indolently permitted the Emperor of the West to approach within an hundred miles of her capital. The fate of the East was decided in two great battles, so similar in almost every circumstance, that we can scarcely distinguish them from each other, except by observing that the first was fought near Antioch, and the second near Amisa. In both, the Queen of Palmyra animated the armies by her presence, and devolved the execution of her orders on Zabdas, who had already signalized his military talents by the conquest of Egypt. After the defeat of Amisa, Zenobia found it impossible to collect a third army. Palmyra was the last resource of the widow of Odinatus. She retired within the walls of her capital, made every preparation for a vigorous resistance, and declared, with the intrepidity of a heroine, that the last moment of her reign and of her life should be the same. The firmness of Zenobia was supported by the hope, that in a very short time famine would compel the Roman army to repass the desert, but fortune, and the perseverance of Aurelian, overcame every obstacle. It was then that Zenobia resolved to fly, she mounted the fleetest of her dromedaries, and had already reached the banks of the Euphrates, about sixty miles from Palmyra, when she was overtaken by the pursuit of Aurelian's light horse, seized, and brought back a captive to the feet of the emperor. Her capital soon afterwards surrendered, and was treated with unexpected lenity. Subsequently, when provoked by the intelligence that the Parmaenians had massacred the governor, 
Palmyra felt the irresistible weight of his resentment. But it is easier to destroy than to restore. The seat of commerce, of arts, and of Zenobia, gradually sunk into an obscure town, a trifling fortress, and at length a miserable village. Pocahontas, 1594-1617 Written by Dr. Hugh Murray On a signal from their leader, they, the natives of Virginia, laid down their bows and arrows, and led Captain Smith, of the expedition, 1607, under strict guard to their capital. He was there exhibited to the women and children, and a wild war dance was performed round him in fantastic measures, and with frightful yells and contortions. He was then shut up in a long house, and supplied at every meal with as much bread and venison as would have dined twenty men, but receiving no other sign of kindness, he began to dread that they were fattening in order to eat him. At last he was led to Pamunkey, the residence of Powhatan, the king, it was here his doom was sealed. The chief received him in pomp, wrapped in a spacious robe of raccoon skins, with all the tails hanging down. Behind appeared two long lines of men and women, with faces painted red, heads decked with white down, and necks quite encircled with chains of beads. A lady of rank presented water to wash his hands, another a bunch of feathers to dry them. A long deliberation was then held, and the result proved fatal. Two large stones were placed before Powhatan, and, by the united efforts of the attendants, Smith was dragged to the spot, his head laid on one of them, and the mighty club was raised, a few blows of which were to terminate his life. In this last extremity, when every hope seemed past, a very unexpected interposition took place. Pocahontas, the youthful and favorite daughter of this savage chief, was seized with those tender emotions which form the ornament of her sex. Advancing to her father, she in the most earnest terms supplicated mercy for the stranger, and though all her entreaties were lost on that savage heart, her zeal only redoubled. She ran to Smith, took his head in her arms, laid her own upon it, and declared that the first death blow must fall upon her. The barbarian's breast was at length softened, and the life of the Englishman was spared. Smith was afterwards liberated and sent to Jamestown, where he was installed as president. As Powhatan's favor was to be courted, there had been sent handsome presents, with materials to crown him with splendor, in the European style. With only four companions he courageously repaired to the residence of the monarch, inviting him to come and be crowned at Jamestown. The party were extremely well received, though once they heard in the adjoining would outcry so hideous as made them flee to their arms, but Pocahontas assured them they had nothing to fear. Subsequently, Smith was repeatedly in danger, and again, on one occasion, was saved by a second interposition of Pocahontas, who, at the risk of her father's displeasure, ran through the woods on a dark night to give him warning. But the kindness of this princess was ill repaid by the English, to whom she was so much attached, for Argyll, an enterprising naval commander, afterwards contrived, through an Indian who had become his sworn friend, to inveigle on board his vessel the fair Pocahontas. Regardless of her tears and entreaties he conveyed her to Jamestown, where she was well treated, but in a negotiation for her ransom, exorbitant terms were demanded, which her father indignantly rejected, and the breach seemed only widened. Happily, the chains of the princess's captivity were lightened by others of a more pleasing nature. Mr. John Rolfe, a respectable young man, was smitten with her dignified demeanor, and found no difficulty in gaining her affections. They were afterwards married, and she was converted and baptized under the name of Rebecca, to which the English prefixed the title of lady, and her subsequent conduct is said to have adorned her profession. Soon after, in company with her husband, she visited England, and Captain Smith wrote a letter to His Majesty, recounting her good deeds, declaring that she had a great spirit though a low stature, and beseeching for her a reception corresponding to her rank and merits. She was accordingly introduced at court, and into the circles of fashion, where, as a novelty, she was for some time the leading object, and is said to have deported herself with suitable grace and dignity. Purchase mentions his meeting with her at the table of his patron, Dr. King, Bishop of London, where she was entertained with festival and pomp. The king took an absurd apprehension that Rolf, on the ground of his wife's birth, might advance a claim to the crown of Virginia. This idea being at length driven out of his mind, 
he appointed him secretary and recorder general of the colony. The princess, early in 1617, went to embark at Gravesend, but Providence had not destined that she would revisit her native shore. She was there seized with an illness which carried her off in a few days, and her last hours are said to have extremely edified the spectators, being full of Christian resignation and hope. She had left a son in the colony, whose offspring, carefully traced, is now numerous, and this descent is the boast of many Virginian families. The Countess of Tripoli Written by Seasmondi The knights who had returned from the Holy Land spoke with enthusiasm of a Countess of Tripoli, who had extended to them the most generous hospitality, and whose grace and beauty equaled her virtue. Geoffrey Rudel, a gentleman of Blue, in Provence, and one of those who were presented to Frederick Barbarossa in 1154, hearing this account, fell deeply in love with her without having seen her, and prevailed upon one of his friends, Bertrand Dolomon, a troubadour like himself, to accompany him to the Levant. In 1162 he quitted the court of England, whither he had been conducted by Geoffrey, the brother of Richard I, and embarked for the Holy Land. On his voyage he was attacked by a severe illness, and had lost the power of speech when he arrived at the port of Tripoli. The Countess, being informed that a celebrated poet was dying of love for her on board a vessel which was entering the roads, visited him on shipboard, took him by the hand, and attempted to cheer his spirits. Rudel, we are assured, recovered his speech sufficiently to thank the Countess for her humanity, and to declare his passion, when his expressions of gratitude were silenced by the convulsions of death. He was buried at Tripoli, beneath a tomb of porphyry, which the Countess raised to his memory, with an Arabic inscription, I have transcribed his verses, on distant love, which he composed previous to his voyage. They began thus, angry and sad shall be my way, if I behold not her afar, and yet I know not when that day, shall rise, for still she dwells afar, God, who has formed this fair array, of worlds, and placed my love afar, strengthen my heart with hope, I pray, of seeing her I love afar. Charlotte Bronte, 1816-1855 Written by Mrs. Gaskell The authoress of Jane Eyre and other works is, as she calls herself, August 1850, undeveloped then, and more than half a head shorter than I am. Soft brown hair, not very dark, eyes very good and expressive, looking straight and open at you, of the same color as her hair, a large mouth, the forehead square, broad, and rather overhanging. She has a very sweet voice, rather hesitates in choosing her expressions, but when chosen they seem without an effort admirable, and just befitting the occasion, there is nothing overstrained, but perfectly simple. Her nerves were severely taxed by the effort of going among strangers. On one occasion, though the number of the party could not exceed twelve, she suffered the whole day from acute headache, brought on by apprehension of the evening. It was now, 1853, two or three years since I had witnessed a similar effect produced on her, in anticipation of a quiet evening at a friend's home, and since then she had seen many and various people in London, but the physical sensations produced by shyness were still the same, and on the following day she labored under severe headache. I had several opportunities of perceiving how this nervousness was ingrained in her constitution, and how acutely she suffered in trying to overcome it. One evening we had, among other guests, two sisters who sung Scotch ballads exquisitely. Miss Bronte had been sitting quiet and constrained, till they began the bonny house of Ely, but the effect of that, and Carlyle Yetz which followed, was as irresistible as the playing of the Piper of Hamelin. The beautiful clear light came into her eyes, her lips quivered with emotion, she forgot herself, rose and crossed the room to the piano, where she asked eagerly for song after song. The sisters begged her to come and see them next morning, when they would sing as long as ever she liked, and she promised gladly and thankfully. But on reaching the house her courage failed, we walked some time up and down the street, she upbraiding herself all the while for her folly, and trying to dwell on the sweet echoes in her memory, rather than on the thought of a third sister who would have to be faced if we went in. But it was of no use, and dreading lest this struggle with herself might bring on one of her trying headaches, I entered at last, and made the best apology I could for her non-appearance. 
Much of this nervous dread of encountering strangers I ascribed to the idea of her personal ugliness, which had been strongly impressed upon her imagination early in life, and which she exaggerated to herself in a remarkable manner. I notice, said she, that after a stranger has once looked at my face, he is careful not to let his eyes wander to that part of the room again. A more untrue idea never entered into anyone's head. Two gentlemen who saw her during this visit, without knowing at the time who she was, were singularly attracted by her appearance, and this feeling of attraction towards a pleasant countenance, sweet voice, and gentle, timid manners, was so strong in one as to conquer a dislike he had previously entertained to her works. There was another circumstance that came to my knowledge at this period, which told secrets about the finely strung frame. One night I was on the point of narrating some dismal ghost's story, just before bedtime, she shrank from hearing it, and confessed she was superstitious, and prone at all times to the involuntary recurrence of any thoughts of ominous gloom which might have been suggested to her. She said that in first coming to us, she had found a letter on her dressing table from a friend in Yorkshire, containing a story which had impressed her vividly ever since, that it mingled with her dreams at night, and made her sleep restless and unrefreshing. There was a peculiarity about Charlotte Bronte's death, not long after her marriage with the Reverend Mr. Nichols, she was attacked by new sensations of perpetual nausea and ever-recurring faintness. A wren would have starved on what she ate during these last six weeks. Long days and long nights went by, still the same relentless nausea and faintness, and still borne on in patient trust. About the third week in March, 1856, there was a change, a low wandering delirium came on, and in it she begged constantly for food, and even for stimulants, she swallowed eagerly now, but it was too late. Wakening for an instant from this stupor of intelligence, she saw her husband's woe-worn face, and caught the sound of some murmured words of prayer that God would spare her. Oh, she whispered forth, I am not going to die, am I? He will not separate us, we have been so happy. Early on Saturday morning, March 31st, the solemn tolling of Howarth Church Bell spoke forth the fact of her death to the villagers who had known her from a child, and whose hearts shivered within them as they thought of the two sitting together, the father and husband, in the old grey house. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. The Art of War by Sun Tzu 